This is BIV Today, the daily business show from the journalists at Business in Vancouver. I'm Haley Wooden. The affordability and accessibility of strata insurance in BC has become a significant issue. The dramatic increases in premiums and deductibles were documented in an interim report from the BC Financial Services Authority published last June. The final report recently published further explores the complexity of the issue and considers some options for moving forward. I'm joined today by Frank Chong, Vice President and Deputy Superintendent Regulation at the BC FSA. Frank, thanks so much for coming on the show. Glad to be on. I want to start with a little bit of background. Tell me what you set out to examine and ultimately what your investigation into this issue found. Sure, maybe perhaps just for your uh, background, the BC Financial Services Authority was established back in November 2019 as an independent crown agency that regulates the financial services sector. Um, We regulate a number of different uh, groups, including credit unions, trust companies, pension plans, mortgage brokers, uh, but more importantly, uh, private insurance companies within uh, the provincial marketplace. And so what we wanted to do uh, as we set uh, into reviewing Uh, strata insurance was to better understand the key factors affecting the health uh, of the strata insurance market in BC and address any regulatory conduct issues uh, that were uh, identified um, within BCFSA's mandate and to inform the provincial government, uh, the public and stakeholders of any non-regulatory issues identified during the course of our investigation. So I know BCFSA has referred to the market in BC as unhealthy. You tell me a bit about what you found and what you've uncovered. Yeah, sure. Not a problem. Um, so I would say that um, just generally our, our broad perspectives were that we found that there was a bit of a perfect storm of both local and global events, which has really created this unhealthy marketplace. Um, There were some foundational issues um, that we saw needing to be addressed to be able to bring the market back into a healthy state. And really, there was no simple solutions to all this and that there's um, actions that are going to need to be uh, taken by uh, all stakeholders to be able to uh, bring um, everything back to a healthy state. And it will take some time to do so. Uh, There is a new norm for prices and premiums are stabilizing at existing levels, but price stability, not reduction, is really the realistic short-term goal here. And any sense as to how we set out to achieve some price stability in the market? Sure. Uh, the report that we um, uh, that we issued in December uh, laid out a number of different observations, and maybe perhaps what I'll do is I'll Uh, speak to four of them that are major contributing factors as part of uh, the issues within strata insurance. And then I'll talk a little bit more around some of the additional contributing factors um, that needs to be considered here. The first uh, major contributing factor uh, is that claims costs need to show some sustained improvement uh, for premiums to be able to come down. Um, And what we've seen as a result of our investigation was that there was considerable attritional losses, um, uh, attritional losses being uh, minor losses that are not catastrophic. So these would be uh, water related losses uh, within buildings, not complete buildings burning down as an example. And so these attritional losses um, have been creeping up uh, over the years, and this creates a lot of pressure on claims for insurance companies. And so these costs uh, need to be contained in some way or form. Supply and capacity need to also be uh, increased significantly uh, in order to meet both the current demands, but also future demands as we see um, uh, future building growth um, uh, uh, putting more pressure on the supply availability of strata insurance. And then also risk concentration needs to be addressed, particularly to prevent existing insurance companies from uh, cutting capacity even further. So a good example uh, of this uh, is the fact that, you know, we know that there's generally about two dozen major insurers that operate 
within um, the, the lower mainland as an example. And so if these two or so dozen insurance companies continue to write more and more business, that means that it's going to, they're going to incur a considerable concentration risk uh, in this particular area. And so uh, they, um, as being global insurance companies, need to determine whether or not they, they wish to further um, uh, uh, invest and conduct business uh, within uh, such a localized market. And so that's something that um, needs to be considered in terms of the overall risk concentration. We also have another risk concentration as it um, pertains to earthquake risk as well, too. And so that um, significant uh, earthquake risk comes at a cost for insurance companies. And so some people may say, well, we haven't had a major earthquake here in British Columbia, but but that's not necessarily the point for the insurance companies because the insurance companies need to incur additional costs related to reinsurance. So that's insurance for insurance companies. And so these additional costs um, get picked up by the insurance companies because of that concentration uh, of risk. We are also seeing uh, when it comes to uh, strata councils and, and unit owners that that more education is going to be needed um, just to allow for strata councils and strata owners to better uh, equip themselves to be able to understand the risk profile of their properties and to be able to address these particular risks so that they can make the right decisions moving forward for their property and also for their insurance decisions as well too. And so those were kind of the major four contributing factors. There were four additional contributing factors that um, we also uh, observed. And that was um, in some cases, uh, the insurance companies were seeing new buildings uh, less than three years old as being riskier. And so this was a perspective uh, by the insurance companies. This wasn't necessarily you know, rooted in, in whether or not uh, this was you know, uh, the actual uh, situation for that building, but they were making, they're making the assumption uh, based off of the data uh, that they had with uh, buildings less than three years old as being uh, riskier. Uh, and, and so with new buildings, they needed to be able to see some proven risk profile uh, for these new buildings before they could, they could adjust prices. Uh, we also saw in some cases communication between insurance brokers, strata property managers, and uh, strata councils as being an issue. And so uh, I think that uh, our report um, lays out some of the communication challenges, um, particularly with strata property managers playing sort of an intermediary between both the insurance broker, insurance companies and, and the strata uh, councils and owners as well too. And so clarifying the communication flow, I think will be very, very important moving forward. We also had, uh, in some cases, uh, ch challenges with strata um, councils uh, and their properties utilizing strata insurance in replacement of, of maintenance. And so in, in some cases, it may actually be been cheaper to rely on strata insurance to deal with um, issues pertaining to the building versus you uh, proactively, uh, you know, uh, looking at um, the maintenance uh, of the building, and so uh, so waiting until something actually occurs, versus um, you know looking at preventative maintenance of the building itself. And then the last uh, contributing factor was this lack of clarity between. Um, uh, home warranty insurance, which applies to new buildings, and the use of strat insurance. And the reason um, why we've highlighted this particular um, topic in the report is that we've heard uh, of some uh, instances that, it, that the clarity between utilizing home warranty insurance uh, versus strat insurance was not clear when it came to uh, the consequential um, damage as a result of some sort of defect within uh, a building. And so there needs to be some clarity 
uh, provided around when would home warranty insurance um, kick in versus uh, perhaps strata insurance or other types of insurance. That's a really great overview, Frank, of some of the factors behind this issue. And what's apparent to me is that there's a wide range of factors, some local, some global contributing to this problem. And I'm curious, you know, where are there opportunities maybe for BC regulators to address some of these factors? Because it seems as though some of them are perhaps squarely outside of regulatory or regulators control. Yeah, so I think that there has been some steps taken by uh, the regulators um, in the case of um, pricing methods uh, like best terms pricing. And for uh, your audience who is unfamiliar with um, best terms pricing, uh, that was um, a particular pricing method that we identified in our uh, investigation, um, which we've been able to work with the insurance industry to come to a resolution to be able to move away from that particular pricing method. And so uh, over the course of the, the last year, uh, the insurance industry was able to agree to move away from this particular pricing method, which we didn't, uh, which we did see as having some inflationary aspects to strata insurance, um, not necessarily the core reason for uh, the reason for uh, increases in strata insurance premiums and deductibles, but it had some inflationary impact. And so that was something that we were able to move pretty quickly um, in, in addressing um, and working with the insurance industry uh, collaboratively on, on that. Uh, side. We also do have a need for addressing uh, data gaps. And I think that uh, through the course of our investigation, it was very difficult for not only the regulators, but also the industry to be able to to get a full picture of the health of the strata insurance market. And so we need to work with um, uh, the industry and, and, and others to be able to get more information and get data so that we can relay that data back to not only the government, but also uh, to the public so that they understand what is happening in the marketplace. And I think that also uh, where it comes to clarity around home warranty insurance and strata insurance, I think that that will also play uh, an important role in, in being able to sort of look at whether or not, uh, you know, consumers are utilizing the right product uh, for their situation. And so there, there is a role for the regulators to play. But I would also go on to say that I think that moving forward, all stakeholders will have some role to play in all this, um, ranging from, you know, uh, homeowners, uh, uh, strata councils, um, insurance and brokers, um, you know, municipalities potentially also, um, you know, uh, other insurance regulators. So I think that there's um, plenty, I think, of space for other stakeholders to sort of come in. Um, we will be continuing to um, work with the provincial government and advise them uh, as, they, as they look at uh, and further consider our report. The report also notes that BC is the only jurisdiction in Canada with captive legislation. I'm hoping you can explain what that is and whether it's a significant issue in this. Sure. So one of the things that I think uh, we've been able to look at as part of the report is potential models to add supply back into the marketplace. And we kind of capture kind of three key buckets. The first one is the one that you, uh, you just touched on, which is captive insurance. And BC is the only jurisdiction in Canada uh, that has captive legislation. And what that basically is, is it's a uh, way for um, um, organizations to be able to set up a self-insurance entity. And so that, that uh, self-insurer would then be um, basically insuring uh, its parent um, organization. And that has the potential to provide more long-term price stability um, and supply, but it's really not meant to, ex to um, bring down premiums overall in the market. It is a uh, help um, in terms of providing additional capacity and supply and, and stability for premiums, particularly for uh, strata councils potentially. Uh, and so we do explore that option. And I think that there's been some dis public discussion with regards to uh, captive insurance. Captive insurance is um, not, um, 
is, is not new globally. Uh, many other jurisdictions um, have, have some form of captive insurance uh, as well too. The second model that we talk about is um, you know, BC private insurance companies. And so um, uh, it might not necessarily be uh, um, well known to people, but there's actually two ways in which you can set up uh, an insurance company here in Canada. Uh, you can, um, if you are a global insurance company, come through the federal route and, and establish a federally chartered insurance company. Um, but you would still need to get, uh, gain access to the provincial market. And so that follows a sort of a two-step process. But we do actually have the ability to establish provincially chartered insurance companies. And we have a number of them. Um, currently operating. And that basically uh, makes uh, the actual entry process um, go from a two-step process down to a one-step process. So there's some efficiencies uh, that are gained with that, um, uh, that process. And that could potentially add more supply than the existing supply that we are currently have um, in place. And then the third uh, is, uh, is hybrid models, um, private-public partnerships. And we've seen that um, play out in other jurisdictions where, you know, there are um, combinations where the government works with the private sector to be able to provide a supply, particularly in, uh, you know, in challenging environments where maybe perhaps there might be significant concentration uh, risk related to earthquake, as an example, or to provide um, additional supply or, and capacity to um, ensure higher risk properties, as an example. And so there are ways in which these P3 type uh, programs can uh, play a part. Um, obviously, we also go into public insurance as well, too. And uh, we've, we've laid out some of the uh, advantages and also challenges uh, as it relates to public insurance, and that's uh, you know overall in a conversation we're 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 pleased to have with the provincial government. You mentioned at the start of our conversation that there's really no simple or easy fix to addressing some of these issues. I'm curious what kind of timeline we might expect before we see some health return to the market or we see some kind of significant correction in the market. The, the overall market itself goes um, from uh, soft to hard and back to soft um, over uh, years. And so um, when you're looking at the strata insurance market in particular, it's actually a broader um, uh, market um, uh, phenomenon. And, and, and so when you're looking at strata insurance, strata insurance is not necessarily um, a a retail type product. It's actually a commercial uh, product. And what we're going through right now uh, nationally is actually a commercial uh, insurance hard market. And so it will take some time to be able to return that back to some level of uh, equilibrium. Uh, strata insurance, I think, is a little bit more pronounced, particularly here in, um, in British Columbia, partly because uh, there's just been some pressure mounting, as I talked about, in terms of uh, that, that, that sort of the perfect storm of, of, of events, both local and global. Um, I would also go on to say that uh, in terms of strata insurance, it is very much predominated by the global insurance companies. And that's partly because the values associated with insuring uh, strata buildings, because some of these strata buildings can be tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars in total insured value. And so, you know, when you're talking about overall supply, uh, we're, we are talking about fairly large uh, insurance companies um, providing that, that level of supply uh, into the marketplace. And so I think that that is something that has to be uh, considered. And, and, you know, this is a very complex uh, topic, partly because, you know, not only do you have to, um, within the private insurance market, um, make it an appeal, appealing market to be participating in, and claims is certainly a very uh, significant determinant in that participation, but also um, being able to attract 
the supply into the market such that you can bring sort of the, the price levels down as well too. And so it is a very complicated topic. There's no immediate quick fixes here and it's gonna involve a lot of different stakeholders to be able to uh, address this particular issue. Quickly, before I let you go, what are the immediate next steps BC FSA will be taking now that you have this final report? So we have delivered the report to uh, the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Housing, and we are in conversations with um, both ministries. And our, our plan is to uh, very quickly uh, in, the, in, uh, in, in the next little while meet with uh, the officials and to understand uh, how BCFSA can uh, continue to help uh, support and provide advice uh, to them. And so uh, that's, that's where we are um, coming in to provide the information and data and facts um, to help support um, any particular solutions moving forward. Frank, I want to thank you so much for your time and insight on this really important issue. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me on. That's Frank Chong. He is the Vice President and Deputy Superintendent of Regulation at the BC Financial Services Authority. This has been BIV Today. I'm Haley Wooden. Thanks for listening and watching. We'll be back with a new episode of our show tomorrow.